Okay, um, Peter, Manish, you guys are happy to make a start? Yeah, brilliant. Well, um, welcome everyone. Uh, it's good to have you all join today's webinar where we, we are discussing about uh, the projects that University of Leeds, the Global Health Research Group Surgical Technologies has been uh, conducting for the past uh, three years. Um, we are just going to give you a sort of a quick snapshot run through of some of the projects that we've been involved with and uh, hopefully uh, later on we can, those who are interested, we can communicate, collaborate and work together uh, in the future uh, to introduce and implement gasless laparoscopy in sort of rural settings in the LMIC. Um, so uh, the first presentation is going to be about, uh, about the training program that uh, we conducted last year with uh, rural surgeons from Northeast India. Uh, and we've got uh, Dr. Biju Isleri joining us. Um, uh, who has been one of the trainees, um, and just uh, show, sharing our experience and some of the very uh, some basic results uh, with the group. Um, uh, following that, um, uh, Dr. Manish Johan, who is an engineer um, at the University of Leeds, uh, he will be talking about a low-cost laparoscopic simulator that he's developed and uh, some of the assessments that we've done on uh, during this training program last year. Uh, and Dr. Dr. Peter Kalma, you've already heard from him. Uh, so he's an associate professor in engineering at University of Leeds, and he will be uh, discussing about the next version of the uh, GILS device. Um, and we'll take it from there. And uh, uh, let's keep it interactive. And if you have any questions, either raise your voice or either put something in the chat box uh, and we'll try and uh, answer that for you. Okay. Okay, so I hope everybody can see my screen. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic, that's great. Okay. So three years ago, uh, Professor Jane and uh, Professor Julia Brown um, received at University of Leeds, uh, they are the two directors of uh, our group. They received this funding from the National Institute of Health Research uh, to conduct uh, conduct research based in the two LMICs, uh, mainly the rural part of Northeast India and Sierra Leone. And the main objectives of the group were uh, sort of as, as they're described on this slide, where we wanted to build networks with people, uh, find who are the main stakeholders, understand what's the situation in the country and what are the surgical needs in this country, uh, conduct some, uh, conduct surveys, um, understand the health system, then, then come up with solutions. And we wanted to work with partners who've already uh, have been using innovations in their hospitals, uh, in, in some of the rural settings. And we wanted to use that and help uh, these key leaders who've already been involved in uh, innovative surgical work. Um, and also add a research element to it, this work that has been carried on by our stakeholders in uh, India and Sierra Leone, we wanted to help with a clinical evaluation and find out if these interventions are cost effective or not. Uh, and uh, lastly, but the most important pillar of this is the advocacy program and impact. Uh, it's to raise the awareness about uh, the lack of access to surgery um, with the rural surgeons uh, in India as well as the other LMICs. Uh, but importantly, uh, those who are located in the high income country to uh, to, to explain them some of the barriers uh, these rural surgeons are facing and perhaps come with some bi-directional partnership that could be involved in, in form of research and training for now and for the future. So uh, this is a, a group uh, which as you can see, it's multidisciplinary, it's just not surgeons, but uh, the clinical trials, engineers, health economists, global health experts, uh, so as a group, we all came together, which makes it quite unique uh, to have different expertise uh, from different specialties uh, to, to promote and evaluate the global surgery work that we've been doing. So moving on quickly, you've already heard a lot about the uh, gas insufflation less laparoscopic surgery, and some of you already seen videos and photos of uh, what this GILS device looks like. So, and some of you already operated on that. So there you go. This is what we are going to talk about more on today. Um, 
just just going back quickly on the Landsat Commission uh, that was established in 2015, uh, a landmark paper, which uh, I'm sure most of you have heard. Uh, but in 2015 itself, uh, during the Conference of Association of Rural Surgeons in India in Karad, uh, they came up with these three important pillars, uh, which are uh, which are necessary to improve access to surgery um, and improve the health systems uh, in the rural settings of India. Uh, and as you can see, need f needs and innovation was one of the important uh, issues that uh, had been raised by the Lancet commissioners in India. Uh, and based on that, we wanted to develop uh, more innovative projects, uh, what GHRG has been doing for the past three years. So we decided to work with, uh, with Dr. Ganaraj, uh, who has already been working in rural Northeast India, about 45 million uh, population, uh, Northeast India, which borders with uh, China, Burma, uh, Bangladesh, um, but also with the geography, um, it becomes quite difficult for people to access, uh, people to get access to surgery. Um, and so we decided to work in this region. You must have heard about the global uh, globe search paper. This is the first paper that they had released and uh, a huge cohort study where you can see that um, the advantages of laparoscopy in, uh, in, in low and middle income countries and the issues that are faced. So as you can see that the surgical infections are much higher uh, in the middle income and the low income countries, but um, the, uh, the laparoscopic uptake rate is uh, pretty low. And, and we understand lapros introducing laparoscopy is not easy in the rural settings um, um, and it's a complex intervention, but however, uh, you can see that um, and this paper proves that the uptake of laparoscopy was pretty low in the low income countries with 9% and 8% respectively. Uh, however, if you see that if laparoscopy was used in the LMIC, then this was associated with much uh, fewer complications. Um, so that once again so supports uh, the use of laparoscopic surgery in low and in income, low and middle income setting. So what are the solutions? Uh, so the group focused on the patient safety. So whatever happens, we need to ensure that uh, the patients are safe before any innovation, any technologies are used and introduced. Uh, but it all starts with the surgical training. We needed to identify that, how, what is the base, the basic knowledge of the rural surgeons uh, about their surgical experience or the laparoscopic training. Then uh, improving diagnostics has also been a, a, a pillar of our group uh, and we've developed some low, ca low cost uh, uh, endoscopies, but we're not, that's not the topic for today's discussion. Uh, quality of care, reducing expenses and innovation. So this, this is the sort of cycle of solutions that we, our group started focusing, um, which is the focus of uh, today's talk. Um, so what we've done is, uh, specifically for the GILS project, um, we identified the six um, indicators that have been uh, laid out by the Lancet Commission. And then our projects have been based and targeted to these um, six indicators. And all, out of all of that, you can see that the GILS training program was about uh, improving the specially surgical workforce uh, and also equipping the surgeons to do laparoscopic surgery. We, we then developed a, a registry where uh, the rural surgeons, after they were trained, uh, when they performed these procedures, uh, these procedures were um, uh, logged on on a registry and uh, we, we gathered the outcome data. Uh, health economics analysis, we need to find out if these laparoscopic procedures or gasless laparoscopy is a cost effective thing for the rural settings of Northeast India. Um, and also the qualitative assessment, we need to understand uh, the quality, safety, um, acceptability, feasibility of uh, using gills in rural setting. One thing is about having an innovation, um, having a surgical technique, but the second is to actually see if it fits in right in these rural settings and also to find out from the patients if this is something that uh, they would prefer as part of an intervention, though uh, to the uh, clinicians, it might feel that that's the right thing to do, but I think it's that once again, a bi-directional process when it comes to uh, introducing a, a technology or a procedure in a rural setting, we need to understand what our patients think about these new interventions. 
So briefly going to touch about the target training program. So this, this, was, uh, for, uh, this was the main part of uh, our Gill's study, which got the whole study started, where we had to identify who were these uh, rural surgeons who were interested in laparoscopic surgery. Uh, and these all connections came uh, from Dr. Ganaraj. So uh, these were the hospitals that Dr. Ganaraj has been supporting over the years. Um, and as you can see, the terrains, the locations there, uh, from the northern border is Bhutan and the north, um, north, uh, northeastern border is China, Bangladesh uh, in the south. So you can see uh, the locality of uh, where these rural surgeons are coming from. So anyways, we identified these rural surgeons who came from these uh, almost uh, six to seven different places. And we decided that the training program needs to be uh, a standardized training program as much as we can standardize um, by using um, validated training um, programs that have been used to assess uh, surgeons in training uh, or uh, junior surgeons in laparoscopic surgery uh, in high income countries. Um, so we approached the fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery by SAGES um, to to take consent that if we can use their uh, five step approach um, where, uh, to train rural surgeons in uh, these laparoscopic skills. So what are we going to talk about is, um, is, is a modified approach of the FLS training program because this, is, this was not an FLS uh, training but we have used their, um, their publications and their methodology to uh, use a validated training uh, program and evaluation of the skills of our laparoscopic surgeons. So that was limited to the uh, simulation side of things, but we also wanted to understand what, is a, uh, what are the operative skills. Um, so under intense supervision, uh, we, um, we assessed their um, sort of surg basic surgical skills, which can be assessed by the OSAT score. Um, and their um, hand-eye coordination of laparoscopic skills, depth perception uh, by something called the goal score. So then the whole target training program was divided into like three stages. Um, before the training program even started, we, we provided them with some online uh, training material, thankfully provided for free by FLS and a wealth of um, uh, online material that Dr. Ganaraj has developed. Uh, so we provided them so that they can access through these videos, understand the basics of laparoscopic surgery. And then it was, uh, it was, a, it was a three day training program where the surgeons were invited. Uh, we gave them uh, MCQ, so they, they filled in MCQs. We trained them how to set up the Gills device uh, and assess them on this OSAT score. Um, and before we gave them any, um, so simulation training, we, we assessed their pre-training scores on the five different tasks, which I'll talk about later on. Then we move on to the intermediate state where we actually give them some sort of focus training on how they can improve uh, their laparoscopic skills. So we had trainers, the faculty was, was uh, sort of, uh, surgeons from India uh, who trained uh, the rural surgeons. Uh, so all that the, the, you know, the team from University of Leeds did was to um, established this training program, come up with this structure, but uh, it was a sustainable training program which was delivered by the um, consultant surgeons from, from in-country. We also assessed their uh, live operative skills um, and hands-on uh, skills, as I mentioned before, by using goals and OSADs. And then the final stage was uh, to do a final assessment of their five tasks of simulation uh, understand uh, with all the discussions and knowledge that was imparted during the course, if that has changed into their uh, post-training uh, MCQ scores and then get some feedback from them. So as you can see, this was a structure that we came up, but this all happened in the three, three day period of our training. So these are the five different tasks that we used um, as per the FLS. So peg transfer, uh, precision cutting, um, tying an endo loop, uh, intracorporeal and extracorporeal. So as you can see, most of these procedures you would essentially do uh, when you're doing laparoscopic surgery and these skills sort of directly translate when you start operating on patients. We used um, um, a UK-based company called Innovus uh, who provided us, with, provided us with this laparoscopic simulator, which you can see on the side, which is 
about 500 to 600 pound each. Uh, so that was the price of this simulator. So, um, so as you can see over here, the assessment is ongoing of our, our rural surgeons who are practicing, uh, training and practicing and being assessed uh, on the laparoscopic simulator. And this was the whole group of um, participants, uh, assessors, and the University of Leeds team, which we had a great fun. So uh, touching on some of the scores, as you can see, there's the, the pre-training and post-training scores is a box plot uh, where the scores are out of 50. Um, and you can see that um, there, is, um, there is some improvement in the MCQ scores, uh, pre-training and post-training. Um, though there isn't a huge difference, I, I think I just wanted to stress that uh, the training, education and knowledge that you impart during uh, the training program is essential because uh, apart from the practical skills that would improve, I think the focus on theory and knowledge is also very important. So, so this, this was reassuring to see uh, the scores uh, improve post-training. Um, there's a quick line plot about the, the different tasks. Um, the, so these are all normalized scores of all these uh, five different tasks uh, of all our um, sort of eight trainees. Um, some lines might be absent because th there was some missing data, uh, but, but we have got a majority of the trainees present on, on this line graph. And you can see that uh, in majority of the tasks, um, there has been sort of pre-training, post-training, improvement in the post-training scores. Um, apart from the PEC transfer, um, and um, so sort of intra the intracorporeal uh, suturing, um, I think the scores have been sort of equal, uh, but but the scores definitely improved in the circle as a precision cutting and endo loop and extracorporeal. These are the sort of the uh, final final scores um, of all our uh, trainees who participated, and as you can see, the general trend of. Uh, improvement scores when you sum all the scores up uh, has been uh, has shown improvement from pre-training versus post-training. But these are scores all from those uh, three day <clears throat> three day training program. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is one of the pictures actually Do Dr. Biju Slery who's uh, he was on our call at the moment who is uh, who is being assessed uh, to set up the Gills apparatus and then perform a diagnostic laparoscopy um, in a hospital in Kolkata. Uh, briefly want to share some of the scores, uh, results. Uh, so the SPORSAT score, uh, once again, it's like your, uh, your hands-on skills assessment. So what is your tissue handling, instrument handling? Um, so it has sort of different, uh, seven different criteria, and each criteria is marked out of five. Um, so the mean score uh, for that was um, just uh, 24 and a half. Um, and the time to set up the gills device was um, so one and a half minute. Um, the skin incision to satisfactory view, uh, yes, took about seven minutes. Uh, but some of the data from the registry reveals that the, oh, uh, the average score of the surgeons uh, who are ap operating now, the time of skin incision to sat satisfactory view is about, about one and a half to two minutes. Um, so there are there are no direct comparators over here because these were uh, an average scores of all the rural surgeons who were operating. But still, it it gives you an idea that their surgery gives you an idea of their surgical skills um, compared to what would be the ideal, which is never the case uh, for any surgical uh, trainees or uh, junior surgeons. And for the goal score, as you can see that uh, their laparoscopic skills, uh, which are hand-eye coordination, depth perception was about 16 and a half uh, out of 25. And the diagnostic lap time, so they had to assess all different organs, uh, intraperitoneal organs uh, in that time that they had to do a head down, um, head, head down, head up. Uh, to, to move the small bowel and assess, survey the small bowel. So this is all that they did. And the average was about sort of seven minutes, which wasn't bad uh, for uh, conducting laparoscopic, uh, under gills, um, conducting diagnostic laparoscopy under gills. So, so following that, uh, uh, following this training program, um, the, the rural surgeons then 
participate in participated in proctorship, and this happened in their own settings. So the first setting where the rural surgeons were uh, were being assessed as part of the target training was in a tertiary hospital in Kolkata, but this was in their own setting with their own staff, with their own you know, um, healthcare setup that they had. Um, and as you can see over here, Dr. Islari once again, operating uh, with his uh, own staff, his own patients. And, and this sort of gave them um, an experience as well, how it would be to operate in their own settings. Um, during the proctorship, we had the same uh, experts who were present at the target training program, program were present at this uh, proctorship as well. Uh, but this uh, this time it was there were no assessments, but just uh, we wanted uh, the rural surgeons to uh, gain the experience, uh, knowledge, and uh, ask for any questions from the supervisors who were present. Um, so, um, so just coming to the final uh, final slides, that sur surgical innovations NMIC uh, is got to be responsible innovation, it's got to be frugal, and it's got to be collaborative. And I think that has been sort of the experience uh, of us as a group uh, that uh, you first of all need to know if this innovation is going to work uh, and sort of responsibly approach to that. It has to be frugal when it's in the rural setting and it has to be collaborative. Um, that's it, thank you very much. This is the um, photo of the hospital where Dr. Biju Slurry works, so there you go. Okay, so. Um, that's that's it from my end. I wonder if um, if people who are present have any questions uh, about about the presentation or any specific questions. But we can sort of take questions in the end as well if you like. I think we have. A Dr. Anurag Mishra from uh, MAMC Delhi and uh, Dr. Rajiv Wilkinson from Nagpur, both of us have joined us. Yeah. Maybe they can just say a few words to the others about uh, what they feel about uh, learning girls. Hi, hi, hello everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Anurag. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can. Yes. Sir. Hi, uh, so yeah, I think uh, the whole target uh, study experience was uh, very nice. And I think that was the firm, first formal training we also underwent uh, into gasless. And uh, that, uh, so it, it basically proved us that this is a very, uh, this is a procedure which can be learned uh, using the simple uh, tools and the, the activities, which uh, Noel already pointed out. So, it's a, it's a great positive uh, from the learning side of it. Yes. Over. And Dr. Biju, what surgery are you doing? We can see your theater now. Yes, uh, this is a case of uh, ovarian cyst, multiple loculated, and uh, it is uh, very large, uh, up to umbilicus size. Uh, are you going to do gills? I expect so much of additions here. I have done M MRI, which has given us chocolate seeds with lots of additions possibility. Maybe you can have a look and see. Maybe possible, then you can open if you can't. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to do gills? Yeah, you can try. Have a look inside, and if you think it's too much, you can't proceed. Yeah, it's very difficult out. because uh, the mass itself is up to umbilicus. Yeah, it's okay. Once you decompress, it should not be a problem. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> you can show it uh, this live one. Sure, sure. I'll try with gills. Sure. Okay, I think um, because uh, we are very of time and we've got two more presentations, so I'll get um, Dr. Manish Chauhan to. Uh, continue with the presentation and I'm sure if you have any questions you can either email us or contact us on the later on stage that's absolutely fine so hello everyone um, hope you can see my screen yes we can okay uh, uh, so as Noel just presented about the target training protocol 
uh, and the way people were actually trained in the guilds uh, skill set um, as a part of the same study uh, we piloted a, a work towards uh, a laparoscopic simulator which we named as lab pack and the idea was basically a laparoscopic simulator which is in a packet and it could be used by uh, surgeons or trainees to improve their skills in laparoscopy and uh, so the basic idea behind uh, this uh, the motivation behind this uh, development of this device was basically to provide training in laparoscopic surgery which is obviously at a, accepted as a global gold standard for treatment in uh, with limited access to it, uh, expensive equipment is basically one of the biggest uh, hurdle in the acceptance of laparoscopic surgery where there are close to 143 million cases annually and it is uh, published saying that that 18 millions of these cases are available to laparoscopic surgery so there is ample demand for training in laparoscopic surgery uh, not only in low and middle income countries even in developed nations and when we when i talk about low and middle income countries there are situations like these which are quite normal uh, in rural settings or even in urban settings there are people there are immense amount of people who really need help so the primary motivation is to provide training to the medical staff so that they meet the surgical healthcare demand and uh, with this uh, thought in mind there are so many simulators available in market like there are non commercial simulators you just you will find people making simulators out of normal cardboard or uh, even plastic boxes or if you go for a commercial one then there are very high end uh, simulators with virtual reality goggles or even they'll have uh, particular camera, light source, all sorts of things. So I happen to have, uh, uh, there are some publications which which say, which do a review of the commercial and the non-commercial simulators available in market. And they say there are close to 55% uh, non-commercial simulators and 92% uh, of the simulators which are available commercially only those have at least one type of validation and their cost ranges uh, fr from three dollar three pounds to 216 pounds for non-commercial ones and close to 2000 pounds for uh, commercial pounds uh, sorry commercial simulator obviously the key components i have already said that there is an ab abdominal cavity some port side some light source camera visualization monitor these are all the things which are integral part of a uh, uh, laparoscopic simulator. Now, when I talk about validation, so basically the key question which uh, a person needs, which I think should be asked when we actually look for validation in a laparoscopic simulator is like, um, will the person start practicing laparoscopic uh, uh, live surgery once he is practiced on the laparoscopic simulator? and how many hours will he need to do that so that he reaches a required skill? And if he has reached the required skill, does he needs to practice again or refresh his skills again? And what kind of tasks should one practice and are they standardized according to an international standard? And the level of skill, which if you see these images, like the surgeons are actually look, is this, uh, looking at the screen and parallelly operating on the patient. It's almost like playing a video game, but you're not exactly looking at the target, but you're looking somewhere else and then performing your surgery somewhere else. So then obviously the abdomen is inflated with carbon dioxide or the gasless device, like probably with Pete is going to present now. Um, laparoscopic instruments are introduced to the trokers and then they're performed, used on the patients 
and then somebody needs to learn how to operate the camera parallelly. So there are so many cognitive tasks um, which needs to be performed here. And as you see, this is Dr. Gandraj working in the same image. Uh, so what I, uh, I tried to analyze and spread out what is the real need uh, behind, which, though there are so many commercially in available laparoscopic simulators, why then there is some need? So I think the need is basically to, to fill the gap where there's limited access to a specialized training equipment, and especially those which are already available and they're quite expensive enough. And then you need time intensive training, which is like again and again, you have to go over it and you have to monitor your skill, whether you have reached a certain level and that needs to be assessed uh, based on an international standard module. And because of that, we, we came up with the solution which we uh, named as LabPad. And the idea behind this device was basically to, to create a home or a hospital-based training equipment, which is easy to assemble and assembles things in less than like three minutes. Anybody could do that. It's portable, robust, and lightweight, so you can take it anywhere. You can take it to your house, start practicing even in your house. or and So you don't have to like wait for your chance to go to, into a, go to a training um, setup where people are there to train you. And it has been used to uh, uh, train so many people by now that, and I can say that this is, this is validated according to, our, to, to the standard which we create, uh, named as target uh, training protocol, which Noel just explained. And uh, if I, if you see the video on the side, it's 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 quick enough to uh, basically assemble this. And if you look at how you operate it um, and connect it to a, a computer, you can even have fine control over the depth perception or you have, you can perform different tasks. So this, this is quite easy enough to work with and uh, it, it has flexibility to work with you, you know, either your tablet or phone or even the computer screen. You can have depth of, depth of view perception and there is an abdominal cavity which are the laparoscopic ports which you can create and get a feel of how it happens in the real surgery. And maybe I'll be uh, repeating again what Noel said, but I'll add some more information to what the five basic tasks of FLS surgery where uh, this has been uh, standardized to provide training in laparoscopic surgery. But uh, it's not that just once somebody starts practicing on it and he reaches the live surgery theater, but he needs to improve his proficiency towards a target time and the quality of task completed. So you can see that there is a maximum time limit and the proficiency time. So you need somebody who is able to perform these tasks in this proficiency stipulated time in seconds, that is considered as reaching a certain standard of performing laparoscopic surgery. Once we did this uh, training in, in Kolkata Medical College in March, where Noel was presenting the study, we had a very positive response and we repeated this study with uh, Dr. Anurag Mishra in Delhi in Malana Zad Medical College. We also repeated the study in, in UK Leeds itself in St. James Hospital. We did some trials in Sierra Leone and in Bhagalkot last year in November. So I would say that close to 100 trainees have been trained on this simulator and they have been uh, validated. There has been results of validated improvement in their skills. So that says a lot about whether we really can uh, rely upon uh, lab pack uh, as a simulator and uh, which is equivalent to a commercial counterpart. So and obviously the journey was long enough because uh, it went through different iterations and we uh, went back to pe uh, people with their feedback and then further improved the design of it. And this is the, if you see the last pic, this is the latest version. Even you can use your mobile phone and 
get an enhanced screen view to perform. So it's, it's like an independent system in itself. You don't need anything extra power or anything. You just put your phone and there you go. You can start practicing on it quickly as well. Uh, there are some videos related to this on our official YouTube channel, which is NHR GHRG, and uh, you can have a look at it more, uh, or we can uh, discuss uh, offline about um, this device further. So that's it. Thank you so much uh, for for listening to me. Thank you. Can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Uh, what was the cost of this thing without the computer or the uh, phone? And what is the weight of one of these models? Because I'm being very practical here. If the cost is affordable and the weight is transferable, so we would like to get about 30 of these for Kenya. So in the context of weight, uh, this is, I think, twin, less than 20 grams not not much uh, when you carry on like uh, it's very easy to assemble and um, I've not measured it but I'm just guessing it between 20 to 50 grams um, that includes the camera and everything light yeah. source camera yeah, yeah yeah exactly it's not very heavy it's very uh, very lightweight and uh, in context of cost so until now we have assessed its its cost based on what our project has uh, provided us the material and um, obviously the cost of manufacturing is slightly higher in UK. So we're now looking for some partners who can make it uh, in large quantities, which will definitely reduce its price. So I've not come out with an exact figure, but probably we are in discussions with some manufacturers and I think by next month things should, should be in line and I could answer you on that. I have your email, I, I'll reply you personally on that. Thank you very much, thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Dr. Pankaj, it's, uh, weight is almost similar to a cardboard box, not more yeah. than that. Yeah, you can say that, yeah. Thank you. And also if you notice, uh, Dr. Biju is uh, going to start with the gasless surgery. So maybe when he is set up, sending it up, we can just, uh, Ask him to show in his camera for a few minutes. But he can go ahead with the Mr. Peter Kalman can go ahead. Thank you. Just one thing I wanted to add uh, is that the target training program that we we had conducted in last March, um, you saw the simulator, the high-end simulator that we used to assess their skills, the five skills where we have seen uh, an improvement. That say those same skills during the target training program were repeated on the lap pack as well, and uh, so those results were actually not um, uh, haven't been finalized yet. But we've got the data, we've got the results. Uh, so that's that's something that we are going to publish, uh, which will uh, eventually validate the use of lap pack uh, in low resource settings. So that's that's just something that I wanted to add on. Uh, that uh, that the training program, if you use a lab pack, then it should have a standardized training program, and it goes well as a uh, together as a package. And actually, when you're using it, there's not much of a difference between the Innovis and the lab pack, as far as the working and experience is uh, concerned. And one more thing we are sort of working on, we want to validate, is that uh, we are trying to use a locally available material like gloves and uh, gauze pieces and those sort of things instead of the commercial uh, validation things. That maybe we can uh, do it at a later time. So this is for the simulator box and things like that. What about the instruments, the graspers, the dissectors with which they pick up the pegs and transfer to the other thing? Where do you procure the instruments from? So and the that cost. we need the standard ones. So, I mean, all we need is probably one Maryland and one uh, needle holder should suffice for all the practice. And uh, I mean, now in India, these uh, handles are available for as uh, low as 1,500 rupees. 
and the fairly good quality ones are about 3000 rupees so professor so those are the contexts sorry sorry those are the contexts we need to uh, regarding the the practicing instruments you know i guess you need one maryland one scissors and one needle holder yeah yeah and one your hands uh, just for the for the peg peg transfer i think it's it's good to have a combination of a yohan um, a maryland and one definitely a needle holder yeah but just a needle holder and maryland would uh, it can do most of the things and yeah. scissors uh, probably you need not buy a laparoscopic scissors for cutting you can use the regular ordinary scissors also no i think I, yeah yeah i think i think what we are trying to do here is um and i'm, I'm yeah, going to use this word repeatedly uh, is to have a standardized training program so if we standardize everything then we can see the results when the rural surgeons are actually operating because if we start deviating away from um just because it's not available i can i understand that things might not be available in some of the settings um but i, I think if it's as, as close as possible to a laparoscopic scissor then i think that would be better because as you know the depth hand eye coordination the depth perception is different uh, when you're using a laparoscopic scissor when, uh, compared to a scissor that uh, you can cut a paper with so so i think that's where the difference is um so what concerns the tasks uh, yes we we can use a different material for the task but the 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 tasks itself uh, they they probably use cheap uh, you can probably use cheap material it's not a problem that but Uh, but i think you just stick to the five tasks because we can we have seen the results we have seen the results in the rural surgeons which i'm sure people who are present here would um, would agree that the learning curve for uh, gills procedures would be uh, much higher than uh, conventional laparoscopy because of uh, the lesser space uh, so so i think we've seen the results of if you have a standardized uh, training program then Uh, then you see the results when they are actually doing live surgeries thank you Noel very much uh, sorry sorry can i come in here noel yes yes please yes bro thank you very much i really appreciate this so we would like to have a basic list of the standardized instruments that you recommend you know i was thinking that you need a grasper a scissors a needle holder and maybe another grasper so so those are the four instruments basically yes, okay yes now we would like what is recommended and we would like dr danaraj to tell us which are the reputable indian manufacturers who you know manufacture decent good quality equipment all right yes. and how much would they cost be because we're in the process of setting this up and it would yes. greatly help us thank you very much yeah yeah noel uh, may i ask add something on this topic uh, yes yes uh, dr reems yes please yeah Uh, I think it's very interesting this lab pack and it's universally available but as Dr Kanaraj has shown in northern india i think introducing laparoscopy whether it is in africa or in any low middle income or in any high under income country this basic training is very important but you always need this proctoring in the rural hospitals and so i want to give a small warning to professor uh, pankajani if you are going to provide all this you need to be Uh, able to get proctors to teach on the spot in their own hospitals the doctors who are going to perform i think it's an essential part of the lab pack to introduce it at the same time as introducing and uh, assisting with proctoring for several cases before anyone starts operating in this field otherwise you it's too risky so it is essential apart from the instruments Oh yes definitely Dr Reems thank yeah. you very much I really appreciate yeah. your comment our plan at the present moment is to start uh, you know first of all running a course mm -hmm. and this course will be for the proctors as you say and then we plan to provide the sets at these hospitals where the proctors will now train the trainees and the laparoscopic surgery on patients is not going to start straight away uh, they will partner with the hospitals which are already doing it and when the hospitals which are already performing laparoscopic surgery are satisfied and feel that the uh, element of competence and safety is there is when the uh, proctors will be allowed to start so this is a, a very staged process we are taking because our uh, uh, regulatory bodies are very strict about this thank you yeah very good sir panel yeah
Yeah, I'm just going to comment on that. So, <clears throat> so your uh, your first point, uh, Professor Jani, about the laparoscopic instruments. Um, uh, what? Uh, so the laparoscopic instruments that we brought from uh, from the UK, which were part of the Innovus pack, um, they uh, compared to the ones that we procured from uh, one of the local sellers who came. <laughs> Uh, to uh, the training program. So we bought a uh, few of the graspers from him. So these are of India. I think they're made in China, but uh, he's the distributor for them. Uh, and I think we, we just have to be careful. I, I, I think you already mentioned about the high quality, uh, but low cost instruments. I think that will be very important because I know when the rural surgeons were actually practicing on the, let's say the low cost ones, um, the experience that the ratchet was too tight and then when you want to do all the pronation, supination, and all the twisting and turning when you're doing the procedures, it was becoming difficult because then it was impacting on their points uh, of the simulation. So these are, and I think that will also reflect on when they actually use some of these instruments in their actual practice, because if they are stiff, then they won't work properly. And as you know, um, stiff instruments or instruments don't work properly are just uh, so annoying during the operation. So, so I think that's, that's the balance that you need to strike uh, for acquiring uh, laparoscopic instruments from, uh, from India. And the second point that uh, Dr. Reams made is uh, that's exactly what the target training has done is uh, apart from just the simulation, we have uh, combined the live operating um, as well as the proctorships, uh, pro proctorship four months down the line in their own hospitals with the same proctors who are part of the training program. So this is a unique training program where it combines simulation as well as um, sort of live operating. Um, but that's, 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 that's the way forward if laparoscopic surgery needs to be introduced and implemented in such settings. Um, and we need some, some key people, some drivers, uh, some um, uh, sort of consultant level people who are interested in training rural surgeons in laparoscopic surgery because because uh, even though there's interest amongst the rural surgeons but if there isn't a driver those uh, key cohort of proctors then this will never go ahead and i think this was successful because of having uh, some dedicated proctors like uh, dr ganaraj uh, dr mishra and the team from mamsi and from yeah so that's just a couple of comments on that so thank you very much. Now, as we plan to expand on this, you know, uh, I'm looking at 18 countries in Africa where we could slowly move into these other countries. Okay, I think this is the, the stage at which we need to uh, uh, follow exactly what you've said. Okay. That the instruments that are procured, everybody is going to invest some money into this. Are instruments which meet the basic requirements, all right, and are cost effective. That's yeah. what I was saying. So if, if somebody in your team or somebody could recommend, because we need to, pro, we, we need to start this and we're looking at about 14 hospitals in Kenya. If we, as we are thinking of providing two simulators at each hospital, so we need 28 sets of instruments. Okay, if it's four instruments each, so 28 times four. So if there was somebody to guide us, rather than just go on the internet, purchase something and you yeah. find that they break the next day. This is what yeah. we are worried about. And yeah. we need help here, please. Mm -hmm. I, I completely understand what you're saying, Prof. Jani. And I think that's a genuine concern because even though they look nice, shiny and cheap on the internet, but actually when you start operating on them, they are just useless. So, so yes, I think, I think we probably need to have some discussions offline and see how best to do that. But what we did for our training was the laparoscopic instruments that we procured for the target training when they were practicing with those instruments on the simulators. Those were the same instruments that they took back home and practiced uh, and used them for laparoscopic surgery. Because uh, as, uh, as you would know that uh, there are some laparoscopic instruments which are not licensed to be used for or not CE marked to be used in live patients. So I think if there is a slight um, um, adjustment in terms of cost, I think it will be better to have slightly expensive, but they are still used for both simulation as well as for live operating. Again, the quality of instruments like Maryland is important because that's what uh, you use in important areas of dissection. Yeah. 
and uh, what you're familiar with, uh, especially for tying knots and other things. The same thing will be useful when you're actually operating. So there's no need to actually have a separate uh, set of instruments for practicing and uh, for operating. You can actually use the same uh, set of instruments. And of course, it's good to have uh, one or two sets so that uh, you can use it. Fantastic. Well, I think it's great to have all these discussions and these are yeah, all I think we'll have it later. Then we'll continue with so, the, I think we'll, we, we can all discuss together. Uh, I'm sorry to disturb. I have just another meeting to start. So I'll just go and uh, leave slightly early. But if, if I finish early, I'll join back again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Peter Kalma who would be talking about the new GILS device. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'll just share my screen and hopefully you can see uh, the slides there. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to, to speak with everybody today. Um, it's a really lovely chance to kind of um, to speak and interact with a, a wide set of people. Um, so despite the kind of the, um, the disadvantages that surround the lockdown around the world, um, you know, it's nice to see a sort of positive um, experiences like this coming out as well. Um, so I'm going to talk today about our project which is looking at um, the design of a, a new system um, for gills. Uh, we've termed that system RAISE, so retractor for abdominal insufflationless surgery. Um, I'm an engineer and I think all engineers enjoy an acronym. Um, so this is our acronym for the new system. Um, and I say we because it's a, a large multidisciplinary team. Um, you can see some of the people involved here um, and there's more besides but one of the things I'd like to stress is that this is a very multidisciplinary project so although it comes from an engineering background we absolutely kind of rely and embed the skills of lots of other disciplines um, so surgeons, nurses, a whole host of people you, that you'll hear about um, through the course of the talk today. Um, let's see there we go so our ambition in this project, um, it came about from the, the work of the Global Health Research Group and in particular Noel's work um, in the target study uh, and a lot of interaction with uh, Dr. Ganaraj. Um, and from looking at the instrumentation that's used in GILS at the moment, um, we kind of looked at it from an engineering point of view and we felt that there were opportunities that we could um, we could take on to improve the system uh, and to provide some improved instrument, instrumentation uh, for gills. And our real motivation, you can see on the right hand side, um, is to increase the uptake of gasless surgery. So um, it's not the only barrier, but we're saying that potentially one of the barriers is the instrumentation is getting good instrumentation to let you do this surgery uh, efficiently and cost effectively. So uh, if we can um, look at designing a system from first principles and that was our aim so going right back from the scratch and understanding what's required in gasless surgery uh, and then going through this design process that we do in engineering uh, it's quite commonplace to to look at innovation evaluation and then going all the way through to manufacturing we can go through that process hand in hand with people who do gasless surgery um, we hope that we come up with a better system at the end of it uh, that can hopefully help increase the use of, of gasless surgery of, of gills. So that's our, our motivation. Um, as I said, we're a, a team uh, primarily of engineers, um, but bringing in lots of other groups. So you can see some of the people involved here. Um, so here's Millie, who works with us in mechanical engineering. Uh, and then we're teaming up quite closely um, with a product design company called PDM, who are based in uh, in Yorkshire as well, uh, which is near where we're based. Uh, so this is Richard, Richard Hall, and this is Pippa Bridges. So product designers, they have a slightly different emphasis and their real skill set is making things which are user friendly, which are easy to interact with. Um, so uh, whereas an engineering solution might not always be the most elegant, the product design solution kind of helps push towards something which is very easy to use um, and so it kind of fits into that surgical environment well so that's our kind of our, our aim so you can see that the, the two go very hand in hand and then we've got Dr Ganraj here one of the visits that he came across uh, to Leeds and we've also worked closely with uh, 
Anurag and Lovanish, so Dr. Anurag Mishra and Lovanish Baines um, from MAMSI. And that provides some surgical input alongside Noel, that you can see here. Um, so the surgical input for this project is really crucial. So from the outset, we need to understand what the, the challenges are uh, and, and how you go about performing gasless surgery uh, and work all the way through the design process hand in hand so that you can evaluate things that we're producing as we're going along um, to make sure that it's fit for purpose. So we'll come back to that again. Uh, and last but definitely not least, you can see Cheryl here. Cheryl's on the call today. So Cheryl is our project manager and she keeps us in check and makes sure we're organized. So a lot of the work we do um, happens because Cheryl makes uh, holds us to account and makes sure that things happen in a timely way and she keeps us all together as a crowd. So everybody plays a really important role here. So I mentioned the motivation um, and this is the existing system which it's kind of fantastic that we can see it um, in the live feed here being used. Uh, and one of the, I want to stress that I'm not trying to, um, uh, I'm not trying to kind of detract from the existing system. It's clearly performed, in, uh, you know, a fantastic job of opening up gasless surgery, uh, particularly in it's, rural areas. Of just for a second, they can uh, go to Bijus. The thing he's actually showing it live there. You can have yes, a quick yeah. look and come back. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's, you can it's, see his pictures. Uh, you're just starting. We, we can see the lift starting here yeah. and the camera being inserted. Um, so it's really good to see this kind of live as, as I'm talking. Um, I, I mean, we looked at this system and it clearly, it, it's, you know, it allows gasless surgery to, to take place. But there were a number of features about the system which we felt that we could perhaps improve upon. Um, so it's quite a heavy system. It's not as portable as, uh, as we'd like. Uh, one of the things that we had an ambition to, towards was to make sure it was compatible with autoclaving uh, as, a, as a feature so that it could be cleaned and sterilized uh, and would fit inside an auto, a flash autoclave. Um, and there's some usability aspects. Um, so we'd like, we kind of noticed as we went through a series of kind of um, interactions with people performing gasless surgery, that there's quite a lot of interaction between the surgeon and an assistant in order to use this. And what we really wanted to do was to make this a system where we could set the system up and then have the surgeon entirely in control of the equipment without needing to have an assistant uh, manipulate parts of that uh, equipment. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that it was uh, robust uh, and easy to manufacture. And we have an eye on cost here, of course. So we want to make sure that we can make this at a, a reasonable cost which doesn't prevent people from using it and acquiring all the instrumentation they need to do so. So we went through this procedure and what we do as an, en uh, an engineering team is we basically derive a series of requirements for the system that we're going to design. And that's only possible if we can work really closely with the people who are actually experts in this. So Dr. Ganaraj, um, Dr. Lovinish, uh, Dr. Anurag, you know, all these people have provided their expertise and we've seen and learned from what they've done. And that allows us to kind of have a look at this and decide, well, here's a series of requirements that we need to design uh, into our system. Um, so one of the first things and, and something that was quite tricky actually is the, the fact that it has to be adaptable um, and able to fit surgical beds, different types of surgical beds. We've seen quite a variety of um, surgical beds used and often the rails where equipment is attached aren't of a consistent size um, so this makes it quite challenging to fit a system onto those rails because it has to accommodate lots of different sizes the last thing you want is for your surgical lift device uh, to tilt over when you're trying to do a lift um, I mentioned about flash autoclave so we want to have a system which can be cleaned and sterilized um, to high standard um, and setup should be easy, um, but the key part here, as I mentioned, is that it should be controlled by the surgeon and readily controlled by the surgeon. Um, ease of manufacture, but also transportation. So making this in a, a fashion like a kit, uh, which we'll come back to later, allows you to set it up and then quickly disassemble it, pack it away and transport it to another location if you need to. Um, and perhaps the last point, but the most important point, 
is it should be accepted by the surgical community. So it's no good for us as engineers speaking with some surgeons at the start of a project like this and then going off for 12 months, 18 months and not speaking to you again and then coming back 18 months later and presenting you with a system which we think does the job and then you look at it and realize absolutely it doesn't you know we've missed something we've kind of gone off off track so that's one of our key kind of principles that we need to make sure that it's accepted by uh, the people that we see ultimately will be using this system so after we've developed those requirements um, we followed some I suppose principles for the design process um, to help try and guide us and make sure that we come up with outcomes which are acceptable uh, to you as a surgical community. Um, so something here that is termed collaborative or sometimes participatory design is this thing that I've spoken about that we work hand in hand. So engineers, product designers work closely with surgeons who have expertise in this kind of surgery. Uh, and all the other people alongside that as well. So we've worked closely also with Bravin and Queso who have expertise in dissembling kit, maintaining kit. These are all really important aspects uh, that we need to consider. Um, so making sure this is a collaborative venture means that we speak to those people all the way through the process, not just one off. So we've done lots of kind of um, work where we've tried to understand something and then gone away and have a have a think about it, produce some concepts, and then come back and present those concepts and evaluate them. So we, it's a cyclical process, um, and that's what we've tried to embed throughout the designs that we've done. Uh, frugal design is also something where we're trying to design things which are not overcomplicated, so they're fit for purpose, they're robust, um, but you don't have lots of kind of extraneous features, things that you don't need, uh, which could increase the cost or reduce the robustness. Um, but also with that, I think it's important to say that frugal design also means that you don't compromise on quality. So we're not trying to cut corners. We're not trying to make a system which is cheap just because um, it's not made uh, in the right way or it's not robust enough. Um, frugal design means that we absolutely have to maintain the same high standards of quality that we'd like to see in any surgical equipment. Uh, so that kind of holds us to account. And I've mentioned multidisciplinary work. I think the other thing to say about that is that we don't want to be reliant on just one representative from a particular community. So we've worked with a spread of surgeons because there's variation in practice and in people's kind of operating principles, if you like, amongst different communities. So we've tried to get an understanding of that um, as we've worked on this project. So you can see here some examples. I'd love to say these are my drawings. Uh, these are actually Pippa's drawings. Um, so as we've kind of had workshops um, with our surgical colleagues, as we've kind of looked at different designs, you can see here um, we're looking at concepts for how we could fit the system onto a bed rail, how we could design the mechanism to allow us to, to reach different areas of the patient. Um, we've kind of sketched things out and quickly kind of tried to prototype them so this kind of communication where we sketch ideas out and we often develop computer models, which I'll show you later, allow us to quickly um, show our ideas to um, the people in the team and to get their feedback. So we're kind of exploring options here about how you might fit the hook to the system, how you might lift the abdominal wall. How can we kind of change the way that the, the system performs to make it more user friendly? It's quite a complex device, the existing system, there's lots of different, what we call as engineers, degrees of freedom. So basically ways that you could arrange it or configure it to lift the abdominal wall in different ways. So one of the key things we tried to do was understand um, which are the key ways in which you need to kind of lift the abdominal wall and position that uh, lifting ring. So is it just up and down? Can we simplify it as much as that? And we quickly found out that's not the case. So what else do we need to do? Do you need to hold it at two different angles or um, multiple angles and have much more adjustment? So as we've gone through the process, we've tried to understand that and then make sure that we've built that into our new system. Um, the other thing that I think was really important as, uh, that came out from this is that uh, the anthropometrics, so the ability of our system to um, be appropriate for a range of patient sizes, so I suppose 
often it's um, uh, the BMI of the patients undergoing gills is fairly low, but we want to ensure that we can still operate um, with people who are more obese and have kind of a higher um, or thicker abdominal wall layer. So that will put more load on the system that we're developing, more load on the design, uh, on the device. So we're trying to understand kind of the requirements of the system mechanically. So we go from these kind of sketches all the way through to producing um, what we call kind of um, basically fairly kind of early stage prototypes. So using plastic tubing, 3D printed parts, uh, we kind of mock up these different designs. So here you can see an early prototype of a system using a hinge joint here to allow us to move across the workspace. Um, and this system here has a slider instead of that hinge joint. So we played with different mechanisms, but crucially we didn't just do that as an engineering community. We opened that up and you can see us here with Dr. Ganaraj, with Noel. We've done the same kind of evaluations with Anurag and Lovanish. And we've got feedback on how these, how these um, kinds of designs might work um, in the operating room as well as in a lab environment that we kind of traditionally inhabit. So we're really trying to understand the usability and how these might function in real life. So we went through a series of iterations and I mean the only really way, the only way to, to learn how acceptable this is and how well it performs is to actually make it and test it so it's hands-on and I think as a surgical community we've really seen that's where um, we have a phrase saying the proof of the pudding you know that's where things really kind of come out if you make something that people can use then they can quickly give you some feedback um, and tell you you know if it's up to the job or not so ultimately we came up with this system here uh, and this system we took um, we built up um, specifically to take to the Articon conference um, in 2019. And the, the real kind of benefit for us was that we had uh, this whole community coming together of rural surgeons and people with expertise in gasless surgery, people who could offer their opinions and actually try the system out uh, hands on. So up to this point, we've, we've done our best to kind of refine the system and get it as good as it could be. Um, and we knew there were, we knew it wouldn't be perfect, but we had it into a, we got it into a form where we could ask people to use it in a cadaveric study. Uh, and then they would be able to provide us with some really valuable feedback that we could then use to refine the system further. So you can see that, um, we've met our ambition of fitting this into, this is like a, a flight case. So you can fit the system and disassemble it easily into a flight case. You can see here that the tube length, tube sections are designed so that they can fit into a flash autoclave uh, and easy um, that they're easy to dissemble uh, and you can see this is actually Noel in this system he's a, uh, in the shop he's about to assemble the system um, for one of the cadaveric studies we ran in Leeds uh, so we tested how well people could build it up and take it down again and then also do the the operating um, part of the of the process as well so if I go to the next slide you can actually see the system in use at the Articon conference. So this was a really key moment for us because this, um, uh, you can see uh, Dr. Anurag here, um, and you can see our, our community here, uh, some of the rural surgeons um, using the system. And we went through a series of procedures where we asked people to use the system uh, to look around the abdominal cavity, to use the system to lift the abdominal wall, uh, to take it down again to see how usable that system was so we observed that in practice and then we also had um, sort of post analysis questionnaires so asking people to reflect on how well the device did were there things that we could improve on things that were difficult uh, and really kind of trying to get some um, insight into what worked and what didn't work uh, and that's been a hugely beneficial process for us so we came back with a lot of information I think from our point of view, we felt that the evaluation at the Articon conference, uh, so this was in Bagalcott, and we're really indebted to the, um, to the medical college there for allowing us to do the cadaveric workshop and, and supporting that process. They were fantastic in helping us make that happen. Um, 
away from that workshop, we, we kind of got the, uh, the feedback that the system was close uh, and it performed most of what's required. Uh, and there were just a few ref uh, refinements that we needed to do um, to improve the system further. So if I just flick forwards, we've been working on that since the conference. And you can see here, this is a, um, a computer generated representation of the system, which has been improved slightly from the system that people may have seen at the RCCon conference. You can see it attached here to a surgical bed. We've been particularly working on things like the clamping system to make sure this is a, a universal fit for lots of different types of surgical table. We've been working on uh, the interfaces here uh, to the equipment. So when you need to do an adjustment, we want to make sure that the system is able to adjust. Um, and we've been really working to work refining the design and then the future for us is to actually get this manufactured by a company in India. Uh, and now the next part of our process. So we're getting a series of these made uh, and then we're going to a series of kind of very second evaluations, first of all in Leeds, and then we're going to work with Mamsi in India, so Dr. Anurag, Dr. Lovinish, um, to evaluate the system in India. And then we'd like to explore a uh, third site potentially um, in Africa. Uh, and the idea here is that we're looking for um, an idea of surgical acceptance, so how well does it perform surgically, and also how well does it suit a different environment. So it's all very well as trying it in Leeds. Are there different challenges faced in a, an environment in Africa or in rural India? We'd like to kind of understand how well the device works in those different contexts. Um, and ultimately what we'd like to do, we have our project running until um, about this time next year, the end of July next year at the moment. Um, we're pushing towards getting regulatory approval for the system. Um, as I've said, we've got a manufacturer and we're looking to, towards clinical evaluation. Um, our ultimate ambition is to have this commercially available so that people can make use of the system. Uh, so I think that kind of wraps this talk, and maybe I'll open up for questions here, um, and then we can take broader questions on the overall research group as a whole and the work that we've done. One thing I'd like to highlight is we have put, um, on our website, um, we've put a session questionnaire, a post-session questionnaire. I'll post the link on the chat feed. Um, but we'd love to hear from you. If you're interested in the, the projects we've discussed today, if you think that you'd like to hear more or that you would um, be in a position in the future, um, please fill out this post-session questionnaire where you can give us some information about what to do and, and how you might have to get involved. There's also some links here to um, the projects that we've talked about today. Uh, the target study is actually under the projects uh, tab here, but there's a link here to the to the RAISE system that I've just talked about, and also to the lap pack system uh, that Manish talked about before. Um, so um, with that, I'll, I'll open up to, um, uh, to questions. And uh, thank you very much again for the, for the time to speak with you all. And thank you to our team. We've done a fantastic job on this project. So I had a question, Pete. Hi there, Prof Jani. Okay. Uh, uh, once you have, I, I saw this is fantastic. This is really uh, something that is uh, praiseworthy. Uh, would would if you had the pieces and things all listed out, uh, and we had some manufacturer in Kenya to manufacture this, would he be allowed to manufacture this as as per your uh, guidelines? Because uh, this is going to be used far and widely if if kills takes on. This is my gut feeling. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, we, I mean, our ambition is to make sure that this can be accessed by people, by surgeons. Um, and so we're looking towards the manufacturing process. The, the first part for us is, um, if I just flick back a slide, um, is to make sure that um, we ensure that this system here, we, we finalize the designs um, so that we can we can ensure that it's, it's easy to manufacture and we can give manufacturing guidelines um, 
to whoever might need to make it. Um, initially, we'll have an Indian uh, manufacturing partner who would be able to distribute equipment to different countries as well. Um, so it may not be necessary to manufacture, to manufacture this in Kenya. Um, but I think once we've gone through these cadaveric evaluations and looked at um, any regulatory approval and standards testing that we need to do, um, then we'll be in a position to, um, to discuss that. So we'd absolutely like to talk to you about, you know, how, how this could sort of work in the future in Kenya. We need, from our funding point of view, we have to be very careful about ensuring the system is fit for purpose um, and has been kind of uh, approved in all the right way before we, um, before we open up the time, if you like. Um, but ultimately our ambition is to, to put it into surgeons' hands and, and into sort of the hands of people like you, Prof Jani, so that you can use it. Thank you very much. Is there any other any other comments? Any other questions? No, thank you very much. So one other thing that uh, we are also trying to work out is uh, work with uh, some people to have a two-way video streaming so that the mentors from a remote location can guide the trainees. Is Will on the call? I think he has uh, talked to intersurgeons and uh, they are working with some people who are working on this, uh, been merging two streams to sort of uh, guide from remote locations. Yeah, I, so I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure about that at the moment. Uh, I don't think Will is on the call, but it might be a good topic for a future call. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think absolutely there's kind of, there's a real benefit in offering remote training um, in systems like this and in, in procedures like this. So I, I would agree. And the lab guru who is uh, live streaming this uh, lectures, they're also working on a system of sort of uh, remote training and uh, mentoring from a remote location. Mm -hmm. So that'll be in addition to the regular training. So we can actually see what they're doing and uh, come in to uh, advise from a remote location. Like right now, we are seeing the screen of <laughs> Dr. Biju. So if you're able to see, I uh, mean, have a better, clearer view of that. And also mark some pointers on the screen. You can sort of guide them what to do yeah. and where to cut and those sort of things. So shall I, if I finish my share, I'll yeah. post a link to our, our website and the and the post questionnaire. If anybody would, if anybody would like to fill that in, that would be much appreciated. Um, uh, let me just stop my sharing there. Oh, there thanks. We go. thanks very much. For that was uh, you know, thank fantastic. you. So um, yeah, thank you, thank you to those who have uh, attended this talk. Uh, from our end, you've heard today about the target training program. Uh, which is simulation live operating, uh, the use of lab pack, and uh, the evaluation, the initial evaluation of the the new Gills Lift device, which we've called Raise. So, if any of you have any questions or want to get involved, or have any suggestions to how we can improve, then please uh, please do fill in this questionnaire in the chat box. Um, but um, we are keen for this. Uh, the training program that we have established to be used wider in the uh, sort of rural settings of um, uh, low and middle income countries. Um, so all the work for the past two years have gone into developing that. So we'd be delighted to partner with you and for you to use this sort of training program. We're in the process of publishing uh, the results, uh, some of the results that I've presented today. So the much wider results we are planning to publish this year. Uh, so hopefully that will be available for everyone to, to look at and um, critique <laughs> and then take it forward for anyone to do a better job next time. So Thank you very much. I think this was fantastic. As we embark on this for Africa, uh, in, in the COSEXA program, we have 90 accredited hospitals which are performing general surgery. And I don't see any reason why 
a female in a rural area should have a Cocker's incision and not get a gallbladder out laparoscopically. So there is a huge potential. Out of the 90, I would imagine uh, 65 to 70 do not have any laparoscopic surgery. So there's a huge potential here. And we wish to work on this and move this forward. This is the degree. We'll start with this, uh, with this in Kenya. And we need all your help with regards to the pelvic trainers. We're already started to see how we can use local materials to produce a pelvic trainer. The next thing was the instruments I asked about. And then with time, we will also need this uh, lift device, brains. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Jani. Thank you, Prof. Jani, for that feedback. That's very useful. Um, anybody else? Uh, you'd like to hear some of the um, surgeons from Africa have joined in. So from your observations, uh, do you have any sort of comments to make? Just uh, saying thank you from uh, Kenya. I'm, I'm Elijah. I've uh, enjoyed the talks very much. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Elijah is going to be our lead man in Kenya, trying to set this up, and it depends upon Elijah how he, it will spread to the other African countries. So just to introduce Elijah in the positive note. Thank you. Thank you very much. It would be lovely to hear um, some um, to hear more of the, I guess the the environment in which you operate in Kenya. So um, for us, things like looking at the operating theatre and the tables and the um, if you've got any photographs or anything like that that you could share, um, I think our email addresses are on the on the link. You can find them, um, but we'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. Sure, we, we will get photographs of the standard operating tables and where we can fit these devices. Elijah, we can get these over to uh, Pete and everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Well, it's great to have Elijah on board, but uh, it's, it's also great to have all of you on this call. It just says that there is so much of interest in gasless and uh, people are keen to drive this forward with new ideas, new innovation, uh, all to improve access to uh, better quality surgery uh, for uh, those patients who are in need. Um, so, uh, so I think uh, you've got all your contact details. Uh, let's stay in touch and um, and yeah, let's let's work on this together. So I'll hand over to Dr. Ganaraj for the final word. Anyway, thanks for joining. And I think uh, Biju is uh, completing his surgery. Those of you who would like to continue to watch, you're welcome to stay on and uh, watch him. We'll also uh, ask somebody from there to sort of explain what he is doing. Any other questions? Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dr. Ganaraj, yeah. for, for the invite and for having us on the call. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work with you, and yeah. uh, we continue the work. Absolutely. I think, uh... Thank you very much. And, and thank you for being you know, an advocate for, uh, for Gasless and, and for helping um, sort of get the innovation going as well. Much appreciated. Yeah. And we from Africa appreciate all of you. Noel, Pete, Ganaraj, thank you very much. Yeah. Have a nice thank day. You. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Okay, so can we just, uh, is there any way of uh, sharing the screen from uh, Biju's uh, phone or something like that you can talk to him? Then uh, others can see the monitor in a bigger thing we can explain to them who is staying on. Yes? Ah. Uh -huh. Thank you very uh -huh. much for your, thank you very much for your effort. Okay, now we can... Uh, See the full screen. That's Dr. Sadhu speaking from Nigeria. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Sadhu. Yeah, okay. We, just, so what do... we want to know, mm. as my brother actually asked, the price and the full complement of the equipment. Then we start to operate here. <laughs> I think, yeah, you know, I've bought uh, many other things. I've bought. Uh, what we call this knife, ultrasonic knife and not the rest. So we are ready to start anytime you are able to supply us with what we need. Okay, I think Dr. Pete Kalmer is on the line. He probably has to do what in necessary to facilitate it. 
if you if you would fill in the information, please, could you repeat the question? No, Doctor Sally wanted to know the price involved so that he can start. They are ready any time in Nigeria to start as soon as the equipment arrives. So and there is some way of training. As soon as we finalise our design, we would we'll be able to give you a, a cost, but we yeah. we would aim to be. Um, I don't know what it will be in rupees, but we would aim to be, um, you know, accessible, lower cost. So we're, we're trying to, to make it lower cost than the existing equipment. That would be our plan. Yeah. So those uh, who are still uh, observing, what uh, Dr. Biju did was uh, he's operating through a single incision. So first he made the umbilical incision, then set up the lift apparatus and whatever additions which are there around the ovaries, he released it. And he is using a vessel sealer, 10 mm vessel sealing equipment. After that, what he did was first he made a, with the hook, he made a small incision in the ovary, then sucked out the various contents. And this is the multi loculated cyst. That is why now he is opening another locule and sucking out the contents. Once everything collapses, then uh, he will leave behind the sliver of ovarian tissue and remove the rest of the ovaries. Again, using the vessel sealing device. Right now, what he is doing is that he has made a small nick in the part of the ovary, lower portion. He lifting up it up with the one clamp and then using the suction to suck out the contents. So what you're using right now is the tooth grasper so that it gives a better grip to hold. And you can also use the suction apparatus for dividing a sort of blunt dissection. Now what you can see is he's lifting up one portion of the all of the ovaries and what you'll probably do is to use a vessel ceiling to cut. Where is the option? Okay, so do you get the annotation thing here? What is The annotation uh, go, to the, go to the top of your Zoom window. Yeah. View options are there. Yeah. Okay. So I think when you're sharing, you can annotate. Uh, so, okay. Any you can annotate with the, somebody else's screen. Okay. Yeah, I think. One of the important thing you need to do when you're doing this is that uh, stay away from the rest of the intestines. Monopolar cautery can be used, but then uh, that doesn't seal the vessels and also the electricity can spread laterally. And that is the reason why bipolar or vessel sealing is better. So now he's near the ovarian uh, ligament and uh, he's sealing and dividing it. Any surgery, the important thing is to have traction and counter traction so that the tissues are tense. If they are lax, then the bleeding is there and the planes are difficult to get. 
So it's important to pull the tissues and stretch them. He has divided almost half of the ovaries and this is the probably on the medial side which is uh, releasing the additions, the omentum which is stuck. And most of the time blunt dissection would suffice to release these additions. He is almost uh, nearing the end of the dissection. Now about 75% of the ovaries have been dissected. One of the things that we do to prevent uh, frequent fogging is that we need to have a bowl of warm water. And uh, another trick you can use it to just uh, immerse the tip of the telescope in uh, peritoneal fluid. That also will help. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now we can see the ovary and the other side also. This ovary is almost uh, finished. There's only a small sliver of tissue which is uh, stuck there. And another advantage we have with the gasless is that when there is uh, Boosting like this, we can use a gauze piece or mop to pack that area for a while. Packing will uh, stop the minor capillary hoses. <laughs> Dr. Sailor, can you mute, mute your? Phone, please. I think you're hearing your horn. <laughs> Maybe I have to leave. Yeah. You know? I will be. I'm inside my car. Yeah. And there are other cars pass. It's oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I'll be going through the record. Uh, the recorded. Uh, I think it's almost time. finished, so we can stop uh, streaming also. Thanks for joining. See you next week. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Peace, I think you can stop. I think you almost finished. Okay, so thank you very much, ladies and yeah. gentlemen, for joining in today, and yeah. we hope to see you in the next class.